How's it going, everybody? Welcome in to another episode of the Mav Step Back Podcast. I'm your host, Dalton Trigg, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host and DallasBasketball.com colleague, Matt Galatson. Matt, are you staying warm in Houston? I mean, uh, I, <laughs> there, there's a lot of people that lost power, and you were one of them, and uh, it seems that uh, you finally got things in order there. Yeah, I uh, got it back last night, overnight. Um I uh, I still don't have water, but uh, I'm hoarding. I have water dripping out of my front sink, so I'm like hoarding water and buckets and pots for the toilet and stuff. So it's uh, it's, been it's been bad. I, it was it was a lot worse out there uh, in Texas than what I thought it would be. It's been it's been pretty bad in Mississippi, but not near near as bad as uh, you know what's been happening out there. And then there was a second wave of it, I believe, too. So yeah. It, just a mess they uh they they aren't prepared for the winter storm stuff um a lot of stuff's been coming out about it lately but anyway uh it's it's nice to have power back it's nice to have heat um and internet especially because now i don't have to stare at the ceiling all day so yeah it's, it's yeah okay. i mean we i had kind of before all this happened i kind of uh planned to do a pod after the Mavs played the the Pistons and you know they had they just traded for Dennis Smith Jr. and he was going to be playing against the Mavs again and uh, I'd actually talked to Dennis about potentially coming on here before that game happened and uh, you know then everything else happened they postponed the game and all that so it didn't work out so I'm sad about that but uh, if all goes well the Mavs should be playing the Houston Rockets uh, on Friday night. And the Rockets have lost, I believe, seven straight games. So hopefully that one will go different than uh, the 133-108 loss they had against the Rockets at American Airlines Center when they didn't have John Wall or Oladipo or Christian Wood playing in that one. So I'm hoping it goes better than that. Mavs didn't have KP then. KP – you know as inconsistent as he can be at times Houston is one of those teams that he just destroys every time he plays against them so if KP is playing I feel pretty good about that one Friday but uh overall we're I mean we're, we're going to get into some stuff especially with the Mavs G League prospects they've been uh they've been killing it since they're they've been assigned to their uh, G League teams they're not on the Texas Legends because they didn't go to the G League bubble but before we get into all that Matt just where are you at with the Mavs right now 13 and 15 on the season. I believe they're 10th in the West. They're a couple games out from being in the top eight. Uh, all things considered, uh, where are you at here at the end of this first half of the NBA season schedule? Well, I obviously am a little disappointed with the way things have gone uh, early on, but I feel like they've been playing better the last few weeks, or a few weeks, a couple weeks. Um, I mean, obviously they have. They've, they've won a few games here and there, and they went on a streak, but they seem to have figured a few things out. Um, specifically, Lucas scoring a lot of points and carrying them to, to victories over bad teams. <laughs> uh, and they've been getting help from it'll be KP one game, and then it'll be Tim Hardaway Jr. the next game, and you know, and, and back and forth. But um, you know, I, I, I kind of like the direction it's heading. I, I still think that they they need to fix some other things. Um, inject some more life into the roster perhaps um but you know the schedule with with houston coming up that favors them and i i, I feel a little bit better about that than you know um than i did a couple weeks ago when they were what, what were they eight and 13 or something something yeah. like that eight eight right and 13 so, was the low point yeah and the sky was falling and everybody was saying josh green was justin anderson and Luca is terrible on, <laughs> yeah. on some message boards and trade KP. I mean, some of that stuff's still going on, but it, it seems like things are starting to stabilize a little bit. Yeah. And I mean, as far as the, the Josh Green thing, and again, we're going to get into these, these guys being assigned to the G League, but when he was assigned to the G League the other day, he was assigned to Salt Lake City to, to play with Tyler Bay. You know, you had some people online saying, like, ah, oh, look at there. Uh, there goes Josh Green to the G League. That means he's not good. And then here I am sitting over here 
excited that he got sent to the G League because he's actually going to get to play yeah. and uh, further develop instead of just sitting on the end of the bench uh, on the varsity team. So I'm actually excited about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, it, you know, the way Tyler Bay and Tyrell Terry have been killing it so far in the G League, I have no doubt Josh Green's going to do the same thing. He's going to, you know, show flashes of what we know he can become. Uh, yeah. But just looking at this this end of the first half schedule here, Matt, like I said, Mavs are 13 and 15, so they're two games under 500. They play at Houston unless unless that gets canceled or something tomorrow. We haven't heard anything about that being canceled yet. Uh, so they play at Houston. Then they play a back-to-back against the Grizzlies and the Celtics. That's going to be a tough back-to-back. Uh <laughs> Then they play the 76ers, which you'd think, you know, 76ers are the top team in the East, but for whatever reason, the Mavs are like what the Suns are to the Mavs when it comes to the Sixers. They always play the Sixers pretty well. Um, Then two days later, they'll play the star-studded Brooklyn Nets. Uh, KD and Kyrie has been out for them for a little bit, so we'll see how that goes. And then they finish it off with uh, two games, one against the Orlando Magic and the other against the Oklahoma City Thunder. Uh, so with seven games left and the Mavs two games under 500, where do you think they end up as far as the standings before this is, this is over? I, I I'm saying, I think they'll end up a game over 500 before it's over. I think they'll probably be in about the same position. Um, maybe 500, but I don't feel great about Brooklyn or Boston or Memphis, um, Philadelphia is kind of the one there where I'm back and forth on a little bit. Um, Memphis, I, I think they're, they can be better than Memphis for sure. Uh, it's just Memphis kind of scares me for whatever reason. They're just so Ja Morant. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, you know, it's it'll be interesting to see. I, I, I still don't have full confidence that they are where they need to be. I need to see it against some better teams, um, and we're going to have that coming up. So right now I'll say one game below 500. Um, but, you know, well, I mean, the, the, the last couple weeks. So the way things have been trending, at the very least, you know, the math should be over the getting completely embarrassed, you know, phase of their season because I'm looking back at this. Let's see, they've won five of their last seven games. And you look at the wins, the, one of the losses was that 31-point loss to the Warriors, which was just completely inexcusable. But you just look at the wins in that stretch, Atlanta, six points, Golden State, two points, Minnesota, five points, Atlanta, again, one point. Uh-oh. No, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Atlanta, <laughs> Atlanta, again, one point. Then they finally – had a comfortable win, a game that I wasn't able to watch, and I knew it was going to happen when I wasn't able to watch it. They played New Orleans, and they won by 13, and they had a heartbreaking Valentine's Day loss, three-point loss to the uh, Portland Trailblazers. But they're more competitive now. You know, they're, they've got their offense in order. Unfortunately, getting their offense in order has resulted in the defense completely plummeting. Um, I mean, they've got – I haven't checked lately, but the last time I did check, they were bottom five in opponents' uh, points per game. Mm -hmm. And I think they give up a little over 114 a game, and they score 114 a game. So that's that's not great. The problem is, Matt, I don't know how they fix the defense. It's it's kind of a give-and-take thing because we've talked about before, you get the most out of KP when he's playing at the five offensively. But even then, he's he hasn't been consistent. So when you have him at the five, you know your defense is going to suffer a little bit more than uh, if you have him at the four and put Maxi or Willie Colley Stein in there, like we saw. Um, I think the last really good defensive game the Mavs had was that game where they held Charlotte to ninety three points, and then things just went downhill from there. But yeah. it's kind of one of those things where you have to have him at the five if you want your offense to roll but he's really, really hurting your defense when you have him there too. So 
I don't know what they need to do to fix this. I'm curious to see if you have any ideas on it because it's kind of – it seems like a sticky situation. There's really not much you can do as far as I'm concerned. I mean, um, unless he magically – turns around his defense like he he did sort of at the end of last season um you gotta have him in there I mean he's he's your second best scorer he's your second best player um I'm wondering too like I wonder how much KP's lack of defense I'm wondering how much that is magnified by the fact that Maxi Kleba hasn't been what he usually is on defense, you know, because yeah, since, I mean, I... since he came back from COVID, he's just – he's not the same defensively. And I think that probably magnifies KP's uh, inabilities on that end. I'm sure it does. But also I think that because Maxie has been so bad on defense, you know, they don't have anybody else to fill Maxie's spot either. You know what I mean? So it's, it's not just one guy that's bad on defense it's two guys so you basically have a barn door on defense and that's that's killing them but they don't have the personnel to fix it um i mean the only thing to do i mean i know people probably think that we're annoying at some point because all we talk about is trades sometimes but (laughs) it's one of our things i mean what can you say well yeah i mean but, but when you're 13 and 15 obviously you need to change something yeah it's one thing if you're you know, the Lakers or, you know, whoever's on top in, in, in I guess it's Utah right now. I mean, oh, yeah. if you're, if you're first or second in the West, you don't talk about trades, but when you're below 500 and your team has some major issues, of course, that's what you're going to talk about because that's what you need to talk. That's what your team needs. And I think that's what they need here. They need to trade for somebody who can solidify the middle for them, but they also need to figure out what they're doing on the perimeter because, Josh Richardson and Dorian Finney-Smith haven't been enough either. Yeah. So you mentioned Utah. You mentioned Utah. I just want to chime in here quickly, but uh, they've won 20 of their last 21 games. They are flaming hot. (laughs) (laughs) I I knew they'd be good. I I didn't think they'd be near this good. It kind of – I tweeted about this a few weeks ago, but they may not win the title, but it sure does feel like this might be their year. Uh, as well-rounded as that roster is, as good as they've been. but Maybe they're yeah. the 2011 Mavs. I mean, it feels like it because the Mavs started out that season in a similar way until they had some injury issues. But, yeah, I mean, it's gotten to the point now to where, yes, all the COVID stuff greatly affected how the Mavs uh, could have started this season. And you see things now where, like, the Mavs, even though even though they had four key guys out for a long period of time, they were still playing games because they had over eight players. They had eight or more players available. Well, now you see the thing like with San Antonio, with the Spurs, they have more than eight players available, but the NBA just uh, postponed their next three or four games, I think. So you have a lot of people thinking like, well, how's this fair, you know? <laughs> uh so that's unfortunate i'm sure they have their reasons for it but uh at this point there's been so many games past that though where you can kind of see okay what was covid what's actually some issues with the roster that you do have to you know consider making a couple of moves and the sooner the better too because i mean uh, with a 72 game season and then you're out in the west i was looking at the standings earlier matt and it's like everybody in the West in that top eight has not let up except for Denver. Denver's fallen down to the eight seed, surprisingly. But everybody else above them, eight and two in their last 10, seven and three in their last 10. You know, it's just relentless. They, uh, they're not letting up. And the Mavs, they're going to have to do something. They're going to have to go on a big run uh, if they want to not just get in the playoffs, but if they want to get higher than that seven or eight seed and potentially get trounced by the Lakers in the first round. So, or yeah. Utah. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of what we talked about at the beginning of the season. It's like the, with the shorter schedule, there's a smaller margin for error. And it's very unfortunate that they got off to the start they did because now they're in a pretty big hole. And I, I, the other teams in the West, 
they know there's not a margin for error either. They're not going to let up. I mean, it's every night's just going to be a, that, a little bit more intense during the regular season now, especially as we continue to go forward. And let, and let me say this, this shouldn't even have to be said, but I've seen some stuff online and I, I just want to address it. If you think that Luca has anything to do with the Mavs struggle, or if, if you think that Luca needs to be doing more than he is right now to will his team to more wins, then you don't know as much about basketball as you think you do. Because he's he was an all NBA first teamer last year. And by the advanced statistics, by the analytics, he is having a better season this year than he was last year. And I mean, anybody trying to pin this on Luca isn't watching these basketball games. So, no, they're either an Atlanta Hawks fan or they're uh, just miserable. They're just, they're just, <laughs> and then there's the ones who are talking about um, Drummond and Gobert and all this stuff too. So, we'll just, you well, know. and I mean, look, just for an example, like, okay, so last night, Damian Lillard had, had another clutch finish to a game, he beat the Pelicans. And, you know, Luca beat the Pelicans. <laughs> Luca went for 46 and beat the Pelicans by 13 the other day. So I don't know how this came up. But anyway, the point is, you know, people are saying like, oh, well, Damian Lillard, he just goes out there and, and wins games for you. Uh, Luca needs to be doing that. I mean, it's not as simple as that. You go and look at that box score last night from the Blazers and Pelicans. Dame had five other teammates in double digits. Gary Trent hit five of ten from three. And Mello and Covington, I think they only missed one three each. So you have to have help. Even as good as Dame is, I love Dame. He's one of my favorite players in the league. And he's super clutch. He's really good and everything. But you can't do it all by yourself. You know, he got help throughout that game. And then when it got to the fourth quarter, he hadn't had to do it all himself up to that point. And he had the energy – the stamina to go out there and do what he does best in the fourth quarter. So it, you can't yeah. just do it all by yourself and then expect, you know, 48 minutes of a guy being an all world player. Uh, you have to have help. So uh, I, there's my little rant for the day. I, I think in a sense, <laughs> it's a lot like, uh, it's a lot like the dark effect or, you know, earlier in his career when he was having to do so much, and they were so average, uh, especially after Nash left. And like, there was kind of that gray area of people like questioning Dirk and his, you know, ability to be clutch, his ability in the playoffs and all that stuff. It's kind of the same thing here or with like Peyton Manning. It's like, he's so statistically good, but then when, you know, he can't get you over the hump because he didn't have a lot of help. Um, Which is crazy because Dirk was, Dirk was what, 25 at that time, 24, 25. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's people being impatient, um, not understanding that while basketball is probably the most star driven league in sports, that doesn't mean that, you know, not everybody's going to be LeBron and take a terrible Cavs team to the finals. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, if Luca was in that Eastern conference, he probably could do that. Yeah. But Mavs, he's not. Mavs would be, Mavs would be seventh in the East right now. The top seed in the East, which is the Sixers, they would be a half game ahead of the fifth seed in the West right now. So, it's I just... mean, it's, it's a joke. <laughs> and they need to do a reseeding. They need to do a playoff one through 16 and just do away with the conference stuff because it's – other than scheduling, you know, less travel and everything, I don't see what the uh, – I don't see what the advantage is of keeping conferences the way they are other than tradition. I mean, you know – it, it's – I don't get it either. But go, going back to Dame, he's also probably the most clutch player in the NBA, like bar none. I don't think there's anybody you could say that's more clutch than him. So, I mean, yeah, the guy hit shots. He hit one against the Mavs the other night. And Luca had an opportunity to hit one and he missed one. But guess what? Jordan missed game winners too. Like, I, yeah, I think people have selective memory on stuff like that. Yeah. You know, and, it, and it's, it's – it's especially this year too because uh you know dame it'll eventually catch up it'll even out but to start this season i think i saw uh i think it might, might have been chuck cooperstein that tweeted it out that the blazers and this was before last night's game so now they would be 12 and 3 this season in clutch games 
and their offensive rating is through the roof when it gets to clutch time. So <laughs> they've been on an absolute tear lately, and it's not just Dane. I mean, it's the entire team. They're playing well despite being down uh, C.J. McCollum and Yusuf Nurkic. So I don't know. I, I mean, I, I still think the Mavs will, will end up being fine. Uh, Luca will end up being fine. He's going to do his thing no matter what. Uh, I just really hope with, with poor Zingas that – it's more of a mental thing than it is physically. And I think it is because just from watching him play, he's capable, in my opinion, to physically, you know, move over and help. And uh, his lateral movement just doesn't look like it's there right now. But I think it's more of a mental lapse than his actual, like, oh, he can't physically move that way. Right. Uh, I, I hope I'm right about that. Uh, if I am, you know, we'll start to see it here in the next few weeks and then on into the second part of the schedule. But if KP can get going, if they can just have that second guy who they know can get you 20 each night, it, it makes a world of difference from Luca and for, for Luca. And it makes a world of difference for the rest of the guys too. Uh, Cause right now some of these other guys are just having to play out of their, their comfort zone and it's really affecting them. So, yeah. but anyway, uh, one bright spot for the Mavs here lately, Matt, and I said at the beginning we'd get into this, but uh, they're rookies. You know, we we were on record. We we were very excited on draft night because it basically went the way we, we wanted it to. And I still think Josh Green has a, a ton of potential. I think he's going to be a really good player going forward. He just hasn't had the opportunity uh, to, to showcase what he can do. And it's been a weird season. There wasn't summer league. There was a shortened uh, preseason, a shortened training camp, uh, and he's only played like 17 games this year, and it's been very limited minutes. So you can't shut the door on guys this early into their career. But uh, we're going to see what Josh Green has, uh, what he has to show when he plays in the G League here these next few weeks. But uh, Tyler Bay and Tyler Ter uh, Tyrell Terry have – completely uh, scorched the G League so far. Uh, Tyrell Terry, you know, his, his shooting percentages aren't that great right now, but he's averaging 16 points, uh, five rebounds, and almost three assists per game. Uh, and he showed – I don't know if you've seen uh, most of the highlights from him, Matt, but <laughs> when he shoots threes, it just – it has a, a baby Steph Curry vibe to him, you know. It's just very effortless. He's got that little, uh, that little curry step back deal. I don't know if it's like his physique, like he's a, he's a lighter built guy, so it just probably it, something like that. Yeah, I mean, it just aesthetically, it it looks like Steph Curry doing stuff out there. So I'm glad he's gotten some run uh, with the Memphis Hustle. Uh, he's gotten a lot more playing time than I thought he would. You know, you kind of worry about these guys going to other teams, G League. Uh, affiliate teams and like oh well he's with the Mavs we <laughs> we might not give him as much playing time but he's done really well but the guy that I've been most impressed with is Tyler Bay and he's a guy that I think the Mavs could use right now uh, you know I think uh, as good as he is defensively as long as he is as bouncy as he is I think he could be helping this Mavs team immediately uh, He's 6'9". Uh, he's, he's averaging 16 points, almost eight rebounds per game. But the most impressive thing, he's shooting 56% from the field, and he hasn't shot a lot of threes, but he's shooting 50% on his threes that he has taken. So <laughs> I, I really like what I've seen out of Bay. Um, he brings energy. Uh, I was talking to our guy Bobby Corrala the other night, um, just about this transition for the rookies and everything. And we were talking about Bay and the way he described Bay, he said it was like if Brandon Wright and uh, Dorian Finney Smith did the Dragon Ball Z fusion dance. <laughs> and I was just like, you know what? I'll take that every day of the week. That's what the Mavs need right now. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think if that was actually the case, um, he'd probably be getting a little bit more run with the varsity. I mean, he, he might have the traits. That's just, to me, that sounds like an NBA starter, like 
So, you know, I don't know, but I mean, that sounds great to me. I'd love for them to have that. I just, uh, I'm a little cautious with getting too optimistic about G league guys because of to be fair, you, you can finish your thought, but to be fair, I, I think he was just saying like, this is the prototype, you know, yeah. this is, this is what he could be. It's not what he is now, but he's shown flashes of that's the kind of player he can be. Yeah, that makes sense. But also I, I'm, I'm, I, <laughs> I have a hard time getting optimistic about G League guys because of Rick Carlisle. Because I don't think that he's going to give them the look that they deserve. Even that's if, fair. You know, that's completely I mean, like, fair. Because Josh Reeves was the G League darling last year, and we all thought that he had great defensive tools and athleticism. And when he got to get on the court, you could kind of see it, you know? But I don't know that he's going to give Tyrell Terry or Tyler Bay the opportunity to get on the court. He's given Josh Green a couple of opportunities just based off necessity. And now that that, that necessity is gone, he's, he shipped him off to the G League. And I just, you know, I have, I have a lot of big bones to pick with Rick Carlisle at the moment. Yeah. Um, I, I won't get into a lot of them right now, but like in, in, in the instance of Bay or Green specifically, your big issue is defense. So why not – play two guys who are going to play super super hard on that end and and be able to compete at least as a defender on your average nba shooting guard or you know small forward or whatever and and let them get some run when i mean what else what like what do you have to lose at this point right the way way things have gone (laughs) yeah james johnson's been fine up and down here and there like he's kind of falling off a little bit in my opinion inject some youth into the lineup man like literally like okay play josh green instead of trey burke yeah you don't need to play trey burke next to jalen brunson ever again for the rest of time it does it's stupid it doesn't work yeah trey burke i feel like and I mean, I, I don't mean any disrespect to him whatsoever. He was great for the Mavs in the bubble when they desperately needed a guy like him with Brunson out. But he's played more this season, like the guy the 76ers cut last year than the Trey we saw in the in the bubble. And he had that one flamethrower game uh, against the Orlando Magic. And I kind of wonder if he used up his uh, – all of his magic <laughs> in that one game against yeah. Orlando. And uh, I don't know, man, I, I, I'm with you on that. Uh, I think well, some of these spare minutes need to be going to these younger guys who not, not, not just because, like you said, they need defense. And both both Green and Bay are known as good defenders. And, yeah, they're raw offensively, but they play really hard on that end. They make good things happen. Uh, you have a higher chance of getting a steal or deflection or something, just disrupting the other team and good things happen, you know, when, when players do that. So I don't know why they don't get a little bit more run. Cause usually that's the thing with Rick. It's like, okay, a young guy is not going to get playing time unless he like really gets after it on the defensive end. Cause you remember when Dorian Finney Smith uh, was first signed, you know, he was basically just a camp invite. And then he showed what a dog he could be on the defensive end, and he ended up getting in favor with Rick. And uh, they were playing him early on, even though, you know, his offense hadn't come together yet. Yeah, you remember there there were times where fans were calling for Dorian Finney-Smith to get cut, uh, and they wanted to add somebody else. (laughs) Fans and Yeah, because he couldn't shoot. But Rick was playing him anyway because he was making a positive impact on the defensive end. So I don't know why that same rule can't apply to these guys, especially guys that, you know, you drafted uh, Green at number 18, and then you drafted Bay as a part of that trade where you sent Seth Curry to Philly, who's killing it now, and you get back Josh Green and Bay and, you know, not not Josh Green, uh, Josh Richardson and Bay. And Josh Richardson's kind of underperformed too. So if I'm the Mavs, I'm trying to make something out of Bay to salvage that Curry trade. Cause it, the Curry trade is looking bad right now. 
Yeah, the Seth Curry thing sucks. Uh, it sucks because, I mean, he had an awesome game the other night. Uh, and every time you see him drain a three, you're like, man, I miss him. <laughs> he, yeah. he's, he's, a, he's almost – He's on track, or he's very close to having a 50-50-100 season as far as efficiency goes. And that just doesn't – you know, 50-40-90 is already rare, rarefied air. Yeah. And there he is giving you a 50-50-100. <laughs> yeah. But, like, as far as Bay goes, whether what Bobby said is true or not, there's no reason he can't be the next Dorian Finney-Smith. Yeah. Like, give, give the guy a chance. He's obviously got the athletic tools to do that at least. So just, just let it happen. Like, and honestly, to me, you know, that, that, was, that was Bobby's response to what my, what my eyes see. And, again, I'm not saying that Bay is going to be this player, but just, like, physically how he's built and, like, how he plays the game, it's, it gives you kind of a Sean Marion type of vibe. And he's not he, – he'll never be Sean Marion. I'm just saying, like, with how he plays, like the feel he gives, it, it, it kind of yeah. has a Sean Marion-esque vibe to it. And in, in the athleticism, too. I mean, it's there. There's no reason not to have that kind of athlete on your roster. And instead you're trotting out, you know, Dwight Powell to run around for a few minutes and get hit in the face. And you're running out – Yeah undersized Trey Burke. I mean, there's, there's different ways to construct the, the, the second unit in your roster where Bay could slide in there or Green could slide in there and they can make an impact on the defensive end. It doesn't make sense that they're not. And that's Rick being old man, coach, NBA, stubborn, <laughs> red hour box, cigar, Rick Carlisle. And it's annoying. Yeah. And it's hurting them. Yeah. And look, I don't think, I don't think we're, grasping for straws or anything either because uh you've got national national media guys like tim mcmahon uh he tweeted out the other day like he's even noticed what bay is doing uh, in the g league and he even wonders if he could get some actual rotation minutes for the mavs this season as well as he played so i mean it's not just us calling for it. there's a lot of people seeing what he's doing right now and thinking like man <laughs> this guy could be helpful so Hopefully it trends in that direction and uh, we can get a little bit more. Cause I mean, green, he's had a couple opportunities. He hasn't had a lot, but he has had a couple opportunities to, you know, showcase what he's got. Uh, but, you know, Bay, he just, he really hasn't gotten anything except for, you know, some throwaway minutes at the end, like say that early 50 point blowout of the Clippers that seems like eons ago. Uh, he got a little bit of, like two minutes maybe in that game. But other than that, he really hasn't had the opportunity. So I, I really hope it works out, and I hope he can end up helping the Mavs sooner than later. And that would end up – that you know, I think Josh Richardson will be better than what he's been so far. Uh, it's kind of trended that way the last five, six games. Uh, but if Bay turns out to be just a rotational player, if he – like like you said, if he can just be kind of what Dorian Finney-Smith is – even that makes that trade a win. It makes it look better, at least. Well, it's, it's not even that. If he's three quarters of what Dorian is, it's a win. Or half of what Dorian – because Dorian's a really good defender. Just a helpful player. Yeah, if, he's, if he just contributes defensively to a team that is struggling big time in that area, it's a win. Yeah. I mean, he could – before Dwight Powell got hurt, he was a good player. We we frust we were frustrated with him. We yelled about him, but he was a good player. He was an impactful player. Yeah, he wasn't he was perfect, but he was good. Yeah, he, yeah, he was a he was a throw in with Rondo, but he was the better thing that came out of that deal. I'm not saying yeah. Josh Richardson to Rondo by any means. Don't get that twisted. But there's no reason that that Bay shouldn't get an opportunity to have the same chance that Dwight Powell had when he got, when he came here from that trade or that Dorian had when he came into camp, just the fact that Rick doesn't give these young kids opportunities to succeed early enough. It, it bothers me to no end. Well, and I th that's a good point you bring up about, about Dwight Powell. Cause I think if we want to be optimistic about it, I think that's one thing you can look at and be optimistic because 
the way that Rondo trade went, I don't know that the Mavs – I don't know that they thought that Powell would develop into what he did before the injury. Because like you said, he, I mean, he wasn't a perfect player, but he was he was very good. He was an elite role man, uh, finishing lobs and everything like that. So I don't know that they saw him turning into that kind of player at the time they traded for Rondo. But I think the way the Rondo trade went, it kind of made the Mavs front office a little hard-headed, uh, the front office a little hard-headed about it. Like, okay, we are going to salvage this as much as we possibly can. So they were kind of bullish on <laughs> on Dwight Powell until he kind of, you know, he turned into a serviceable player. So I'm hoping they take the same approach with, with Bay. Uh, and again, like you said, I mean, we're not saying – Richardson is Rondo I mean I think Richardson will eventually get it together and he'll be you know a lot better uh in the second half of this season but I do think as good as Curry has been the way that trade looks right now I wouldn't be shocked if the Mavs front office was like okay let's uh let's kind of push the envelope with Bay here and kind of make this look better (laughs) so yeah yeah. we'll see how it goes I, I think one thing that's getting lost on people also is I don't I really don't want to use this as an excuse but it's true I think when you make that much of a roster turnover to key positions and basically your entire the entire fabric of your roster has shifted like bringing in Josh Richardson shipping out Seth Curry playing James Johnson uh Willie Cauley Stein getting you know just things they haven't had continuity with their roster and from year to year and in quite a while. And this past summer, they made a lot of changes that made a difference. You know, JJ Beret is gone, this, that, and the other. It takes time for all of these pieces to fit in together and play with chemistry. I mean, it 27 games is a lot or 28 games, whatever it is, but I still think they need more time to figure out how to play together. Yeah. Like all the COVID stuff, all the, injuries it's just it's been so up and down for the roster the whole way the only constant thing has been Luca the only constant thing everything else has been out of whack and all over the place so I think that the the general fan needs to kind of take a step back and be like all right we can see what this looks like after the all-star break and as we approach the trade deadline but like right now I think they just need more time and yeah I know I mentioned a trade earlier and I still think that's something they could possibly need. Or that they I do think need, they definitely do. I mean, I agree with I agree with you that the team needs needs more time to gel because the way things have gone, and it already being a weird season anyway, where they didn't have a normal training camp, preseason, all that all that stuff. The season started a whole lot sooner than it usually does because they wanted to rush to uh, the NBA wanted to try to save as much revenue as they could uh, heading into this season. So. It just it hasn't been your typical your typical year all around, and that was even before the team lost four key guys to COVID for two little over two weeks. So I agree, yeah they they do have to uh, have to gel a little bit better, and getting over COVID's hard. You know I I got it, and post COVID was worse for me than actual COVID. You know I felt cruddy for a few days when I had it, but. Uh, the lingering effects for the next two, three, four weeks, it was pretty bad. Uh, so yeah. I'm not saying that these guys are experiencing the same stuff I did. I just know from experience that it can be, you know, the the after effects can be just as bad, if not worse, than what you actually feel when you have it. So there could be days where these guys feel perfectly fine. Uh, Josh Richardson might have a good game. He feels good and everything. There might be a day where he's sluggish and he's having some some post COVID effects. And it, uh, I think it's affected Maxi more than anything. I don't know that for sure, but it sure does feel like it watching him. And I really hope he does get back to the uh, the defensive. What's the word? Uh, the brick wall that he used to be. Because nobody, no nobody would score on Maxi at the rim and you know lately he you know he had Carmelo Anthony drive past him for a dunk the other night that's just that's not Maxi <laughs> that is not Maxi Kleba so I really hope he does get back to where he needs to be but we'll see how it goes uh, I'm optimistic about this end of the first half schedule uh, I think they'll do well I do expect them to be 
at or at least a game above 500 before it's over just based on other team situations with injuries and uh, who they have left to play. But hopefully they do get there before the end of this first half schedule because I haven't shaved uh, in like three weeks and I haven't got a haircut either. That's a mess. Uh, I, I really need to shave, Matt. So I don't know if you're doing the 500 beard thing too, but it's no, getting a little out of control. <laughs> <laughs> I always have a beard because I look like a fat baby if I if I don't. So yeah, I haven't I haven't like fully been clean shaven in probably three years, and I mentioned it to my wife. I was like, as soon as the Mavs get back to 500, I'm shaving, and even she was just kind of like, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know if you need to do that. <laughs> so we'll see. How At it least goes. give it a nice trim. Yeah, <laughs> at the very least, I'm going to trim it real good. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's going to do it uh, for another episode of the Math Step Back podcast. Guys, we appreciate y'all coming in every week and giving us a listen. And uh, we're going to try to do, you know, more YouTube stuff. If we're going to record, you know, uh, Matt, we might as well do this a little bit more often and just put it up on YouTube just so we actually have some content to promote because. Uh, we're getting closer to that thousand subscriber mark. I think there's about 250 spots left. So if you're in our first thousand subscribers on YouTube, you'll have a chance to win two tickets to the Mavs home game of your choice. Uh, once it becomes a regular thing again for fans attending games, they're slowly but surely letting people back in. So uh, if you're not on that train yet, be sure to get on. Uh, like I said, there's about 250 spots left. So go subscribe on YouTube and uh, leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts if that's where you listen to. But, guys, we appreciate it. Hope you have a great rest of the week and the great weekend. And we'll see if the Mavs play the Rockets tomorrow. And if something else happens that warrants an emergency podcast, we'll see you again. But y'all have a good one.